Welcome to The People's View, a program dedicated to discussing local, state, and national issues and their effect on the American people. The People's View provides a platform for state representatives and national figures to present their viewpoint. Whether it's social, economic, or financial topics, you'll hear it on The People's View. Hello and welcome to The People's View. The People's View is sponsored by the Nashua Republican City Committee. I'm your host, Carl Seidel, with my co-host, Pete Silver. And today, we have the wonderful Jennifer Horn, who's the new chair of the, Nash, uh, the Na uh, state, Na New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire GOP. State Republican Committee. Yes. Okay, so you. tell us all about what uh, you Congratulations, know, person. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, as always. I'm very excited. A lot of great opportunities for Republicans going ahead in the next two years. There is. You know, it was a tough loss last November. It's time to put it behind us, be done with that. And a lot of growth opportunity. And, you know, people say to me all the time, so, you know, what, what are you doing? What, what do you see? Winning. I see winning. This is about getting good, principled Republicans elected to office. And I'm very excited about what the next two years holds Good. for us, not just as a party, but as a state. The opportunity to return Republican leadership to our state, I think, is good for all of our neighbors. Do you have something you can tell us about how you're going to accomplish all that? It's a secret plan. I it is. My all answer. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we know there's a lot, a, a lot that has to be improved on, that has to be rebuilt, and there are new things that we need to, you know, address as well. We're going to be rebuilding the entire technological infrastructure of the party. Uh, we need to rebuild all of our grassroots organizations and connections. And, and that means really developing a really strong relationship between the state party and the town committees, the city committees, the county committees. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's really important that, we've, that, has, that I think impacted our, the last election that we really need to get control of as a party is our messaging. And it's about how do we take the core principles of our platform, the core values of who we are as Republicans, and translate that into a conversation that is personal and makes an individual connection with our neighbors across the state. So there's a lot, a lot to keep us busy for the next couple Good. of years. Well, one of the things that I said, one of the major reasons I supported you is because I know how you like to go out into the public. And that's the problem. I think in the past, we're kind of like these people hiding in the woods. We need to get out and tell them what's going on. And right. you know, I spent uh, a good portion of last Tuesday's uh, uh, this uh, Rush Limbaugh show I listened to and his whole show was about, you know, what happened. They took a guy like Romney last time, who was probably one of the most decent people that ever ran. One for of the office most ever. genuinely good people mm -hmm. to ever be involved in politics. And I agree. From March till September or August when the convention ended, right. they, they vilified him. They beat on him. They just made him out to be someone who kills people with cancer and right. drags their dog down the street. And we didn't fight back enough. And, right, and that's right. The we, thing. we lacked a coordinated, um, clear, concise response. And, and, but we also need to understand that messaging isn't just about responding to the attacks from the Republicans. It's about setting the parameters of the debate to begin with. It's about being in charge of the messaging, being exactly. in charge of the conversation. Get out front. It, get out front. Be the, and, and, it, and it's also what, and what you just talked about is, is an important part of it. We cannot allow our neighbors to believe something about Republicans just because Democratic leadership said it. You know, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. That's the worst possible communications model we could have. So I think it's really important as chairman it's that there, there are a lot of internal responsibilities, but one of my primary responsibilities, as you just said, uh, Pete, is to get out there, to, to interact with the community, to be a, a voice and a face uh, that our neighbors across the state can identify. And when they hear something, uh, about Republicans, I hope that we reach a point maybe a year from now, two years from now, where they'll think, no, you know what, I've heard Jennifer Horn, and I know that that's not true. Exactly. I know that that's not who she is, and that's not what, and, and if we can at least get them to question some of these attacks, oh, yeah. I think that would be a, a, good, uh, a good step in the right direction. Well, the other part of the whole program was going to be getting out the vote, too, getting oh, our no people question. to the vote. Right. How are we going to do better well, than we did the last time? Well, you know, that first of all, we have to do better than we did last time. But getting out the vote is, um, it's, a, it's a separate function in and of itself, mm -hmm. but it is rooted in all those other functions mm -hmm. that we talked about. You know, it isn't, it's, it's about knowing 
exactly, specifically, you know, 75 Main Street, 82nd, 82 Spruce Street, you know, four fireside circle, knowing exactly who your voters are, where they are, and getting them to the polls. But it's all those things that we do for the, the next year and a half that lead up to that day that are so important for getting out the vote as well. Nobody is going to vote for you if they don't like you and if they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. So what I've always said is it's our job um, to touch them personally, to get to know them individually, and inspire them to take action to become a Republican voter. So um, get it, and, and the get out the vote function on election day itself, that, that's about rebuilding our grassroots structure, our volunteer network, but it's also a technology issue mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And the type of technology that we use to track that information and build that database in the next 18 to 24 months as well, so. And I, I think that's the, the thing that even at local level, whatever it is, if we are out of front, and you don't, you don't have to be malicious about it. There's no right. reason to be, just be factual. As the saying goes, liars figure, figures don't lie. But when we get caught up in this PC, uh, spider web that we're afraid to say something because right. of the repercussions. If it's the truth, it's the truth. Well, and I also think in addition to that, that uh, I think that there was a perception by the end of the last election cycle, a strong, massive you know, perception that Republicans just aren't nice people, that we don't care, that we don't care about mm -hmm. women, that we don't care about children, we don't care about health care, all these, that we just don't care. And, and I think it's that word that really got to people. They believed we don't care about them. And I think it's not just, as you said, Pete, about you know, not being afraid to just tell the truth, but I think it's, we have to really be conscious of how we express ourselves. As Republicans, especially those of us who are very involved in the party, we love to get involved in these very, um, you know, in detailed debates about mm. limited government and how much limited, how much government is too much, how much is enough, that's not limited, that is, you know, if you're a single mom and you're working two jobs and you're trying to raise two kids by yourself, you really don't care about that stuff. What you care about is on Saturday morning when you go to the grocery store, you can't afford to buy a gallon of milk because you need to buy a gallon of gas. And we need to find a way to talk to people about, again, what we represent as Republicans, how the policies that we would implement will make it easier for that mom to be able to get gas and milk on Saturday morning. And, and I think that that's what it's really all about. And it goes back to the beginning. They were clever enough to get the message out first. They make it seem right. like it's big business that causes gas to be so expensive and, right. and different things. You know, the, the, the whole right to it, work. It's a failed energy policy on the part of the Obama administration. We have it all right here. So, right. There's no question about it. The right to work in this state. I was reading an article today, and, the, and this guy was supposedly a former Democrat, and he did an, uh, an op-ed piece in the union leader. Oh, I saw that one. And, and remember yes. he's talking about he the, the jobs that we lost? Yes. The d difference in, in, in wages of in Alabama of the people right. who work for the Hyundai dealer uh, the, manufacturer? The, the, uh, the different car manufacturers yeah. that have all intentionally moved to right-to-work states. I think there are 24 states in our country now that are right-to-work mm -hmm. states. And um, it's such, it, that's, that's a, in addition to all the political maneuvering behind the scenes that go into any time a bill comes to the floor to be voted on, uh, at the state house, but that was somehow a collapse of messaging on our part as well, because it's such a common sense, practical step for us to take as a state, to to open the door to all of these new manufacturers, all of these new jobs. Uh, I I do I have more than once heard some of our Democratic leaders say, well, we don't want manufacturing jobs here. Those aren't the kinds of jobs we want here. Well, as this gentleman pointed out in the op-ed that you're referring to. They're, they're making you know, a significant amount more than the average pay. I think it was 20,000, 20, 20, 24,000 a year yeah. more than mm -hmm. the average pay in the state. Uh, they're good quality, long lasting, high paying jobs. Um, and for us to decide that we simply, we're gonna take this whole category of jobs and say, we're not interested. Take your jobs elsewhere. We'd rather be unemployed than take mm -hmm. that job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then you know, the, the, the second layer of that is why should anybody have the right to tell you that in exchange for the opportunity to work, to contribute your time, your effort, your knowledge, your skills, in exchange for that, they have a right to take part of your paycheck and spend it on their political operation, mm -hmm. regardless of what your political um, leanings might be. And no matter what anybody else wants to tell you, that's what the opposition to right to work is all about.
They keep trying to do that. They demagogue us. I mean, and, and right. everything. Even the, the fact that I just saw you take a dr uh, glass of uh, water here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, nobody, that's right. Marco Rubio. Okay, yeah. yeah. He had a beautiful the, the speech there, and they pick on that. Can you believe that? And they pick on that? Bill O'Brien on little things like he's a bully and things like that. And they demagogue you before you hit the li get right. you to listen to what they well, well I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. First of all, I thought Marco Rubio was magnificent the other night. Mm -hmm. And I think he did something that the president you know, has failed to be able to do. He was able to bring the, the conversation to a much higher level. Mm -hmm. And he really spoke to the hearts of the American people, to the hopes and dreams of what our melting pot society is supposed to be all about. And he was able to talk about the issues of the day in a way that made you feel hopeful and optimistic that we can solve these problems. And if we do come together, there are solutions that we can, you know, that will help everybody, that will lift us all up. And I really thought that he was a great, um, representative of mm -hmm. what the Republican message is all about. You know, uh, when it comes to what the folks in, you know, the Ray Buckleys of the world up, are trying to do up in Concord, uh, anybody wants, let them say whatever they want. For, I, I don't feel obligated to answer them, to engage. You know, they're trying to pick petty fights mm -hmm. about little things that don't matter. They don't matter to policy. They don't matter to the economy. They don't do anything to help grow jobs. We need to talk about the things that our neighbors care about. The last Republican leadership in the House of Representatives and the Senate the last two years balanced the budget, eliminated an almost $900 million deficit mm -hmm. that was created by four years of complete Democratic control in Concord. They cut taxes and fees. Uh, they left families and businesses with a lighter tax burden, able to move forward uh, and with some optimism and, and the potential for growth. We just heard the governor uh, deliver her budget address this morning. And I was at the State House for it. And I appreciated, and I'll say this sincerely, I appreciated that somewhere near the end of her, her remarks, she threw in a comment about wanting to work with Republicans to build a, a balanced budget. I hope that she is sincere about that. My concern is that the entire budget is built on $80 million of casino licensing fees that don't exist. Right. And, it, and, and that's what we've been talking about all week. The money doesn't exist. And we've got to be really clear, like understand that the, the total lunacy of the premise of her bu budget. We don't allow casino gambling in our state today. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the money doesn't exist, the venue doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It has a dozen times it has been brought to the house and failed. I don't know why she is convinced that it is a guarantee to pass this time. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. If it does, let's look to Massachusetts where they passed it in 2011 and it is now 2013 and they have not issued a license yet. Oh, yeah. They don't expect a single licensing dollar until next year. And then you talk about getting gaming revenues. There's no way that this budget is going to see $80 Any million terms, dollars yeah. from gaming. So, so what happens? Either the budget collapses you know, and we have a horrible mess in May, you know, April, May, June as we're trying to fix it. Um, or what's, uh, well, that is going to happen. It's not an either or. That mm -hmm. will happen. And the next thing that will happen is that Governor Hassan uh, and Terry Norelli will come out and start talking about how the people who voted against gaming hurt the university system, hurt the mental health care system, hurt the education system because they didn't allow that $80 million into the budget. Yeah, but she's not going to be able to pull together. This is the one vote that Democrats are... The, the, the vote is weird. Well, you get as many weird. Republicans for as against it, and the same with Democrats. The, the vote went mm -hmm. down almost. It's not, this is not a party line vote at all. It is a nonpartisan issue. There's no question about it. There are good principled Republicans on both sides of the gaming issue. But from my perspective, what I care most about is that our state needs to go forward with some economic stability. And our neighbors in Nashua mm -hmm. and Manchester and across the state need to know that when they wake up the next day, their job is still going to be there for them. So our business owners need to know that their tax burden is going to be steady and predictable. I mean, they, everything about this budget should be focused on um, growing the economy of our state. And of course, we, we all agree as Republicans that there is a role that government plays in providing uh, a safety net for our most vulnerable citizens. So these are the things that we need to be looking at. The last legislature made some tough choices, but we didn't have the money. We had to live within our means. 
and the governors come forward and try to reinstate the majority of the funds that were eliminated last time without a realistic, real-life-based plan to come up with those revenues. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's the thing that's in my craw the most. The, the whole thing in the your last craw? budget, Is my it craw, in your craw, it's in my craw. <laughs> the last legislative session that we had with all these things that were going on, what they didn't talk about was, again, you go back to the right to work thing. Why don't they say that the real reason for it is public pensions? That's why they're opposed to it. Anything to do with union bosses come in, and that's why they run ripshot over the whole thing, because they're afraid it's like the camel's nose under the tent. Right. And that's the truth of it. So when citizens start to find out that they have a bunch of public pension-based people up there that are making those decisions and, and voting like that, that's where this right. is going. When we're on this, which I still can't grasp the number of, what is it, six billion dollar uh, projected uh, hole we're behind for pay, paying the, oh, the pension. pensions. Yeah, yeah, it's more than the that. The unfunded pension yeah. plan, yeah. essentially, yeah, which right. works yeah. up to like nine thousand dollars for every right. breathing soul in the state, yeah. and, and just for pensions. Nine thousand dollars. Think about that. That's. I mean, if those numbers are right, that's the number we should be talking about. It's just like when we talk about the national debt being at. 16 trillion, and how does that translate to us individually as households? Senator Jeb Bradley has been doing great work on trying to affect pension reform. Um, you know, and he's that you should have him in here to talk about that. You could, he could spend the, your whole show talking about where the problems are and where we need to go to, to resolve them. But the first step to being able to resolve these problems is having leadership that's sincerely willing to sit down at the table together and work through these issues and, and genuinely listen. You know, uh, Governor Hassan said it today, we've heard President Obama saying it many times, bring me any, any good idea and I'm willing to listen to it. <laughs> well, you have to allow, if, 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 in tr if in fact you are sincere about wanting to work, then you have to allow for the possibility that an idea that you don't initially agree with might be good or might be worth talking about, might be worth bringing to the table. Uh, we've got a, a, some really good conservative leaders in the Senate, good people who understand the, the budget, who understand the economy, who are working hard to make sure that, you know, that in the end we have a good solid product. And I'm confident that they will be able to work with the governor um, and, and bring some of the necessary changes to this. I don't know in the end what the governor or the, the folks on the other aisle are going to be willing to do with it. Did the governor say anything about having ways and means actually come up with the in projected income first? Right. Or well, that, did they talk nice. about what uh, they're well, spending like and they and did again, before? Well, we know just looking at the budget itself that sh she has built the budget on revenues that don't right. exist. Mm -hmm. So that tells us right out of the <coughs> gate that she's not taking reasonable revenue estimates. And again, one of the strengths of the last budget is that it was built on reasonable revenue estimates that ended up coming in very near, you know, being, coming in, being surprisingly, you know, accurate, uh, very close to the mark. Um, so yet you've got to start with reasonable revenue mm -hmm. estimates. And if the revenue you're counting on is $80 million in gaming casino licensing fees, in a state where casinos are currently illegal, mm. I, I don't should, know how you connect those dots and make sense out of it. Is there any indication that because of Norelli is pro-gambling and her, uh, do they have the muscle this time for their own party? Is Terry Norelli pro-gambling? I thought she was. I'm a, pretty sure she is. Yeah, I, and I heard earlier mm. that she wasn't, so I don't know, but that's the question. That's exact. But but it's not it's not just the House. Obviously, it's got to get through the Senate. and. Um, and, and, and this, like we said earlier, it's, you know, this is a kind of a 50-50 issue for both parties, so, so it's hard to say. Um, the, you know, some of the folks I heard talking today were confident that there was no way it would get out of the House. But with the governor this invested in it, mm -hmm. she has pretty, she has staked pretty her much. She's just, well, she staked her budget on it, but in doing so, she has staked her entire career as governor on mm -hmm. it. If this falls apart, it will be very difficult for her to convince the people of New Hampshire to trust her with the second term. So I assume that since she has taken this step, she must feel confident that she's got the support in the House to move a bill along. I but hope again, we have the support we'll, we'll in the see. Republicans in the Senate to keep it from going through. I, well, you know, I, I don't know. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to, you know, I, the Republican position, the platform of the Republican Party uh, stands against gaming in our state, expanded, ga expanded gaming in our state, casino gambling, uh, for a number of reasons. 
um, including the fact that it's a it's a bad way a bad way to to, to budget. You, we should never rely on it for needed funds for you know uh, for necessary funds, uh, and 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 the social ills that people are always concerned about in the community where the casino might land. Um, but but I say very clearly and strongly, there are good principled Republicans on both sides of this issue, and I expect that the legislature uh, will make a very reasoned. Um, well thought out decision on it. My concern, my primary concern, is that um, we are moving into a, a new biennium with a budget that cannot possibly stand. Because as I said earlier, even if gaming passes, the, the idea that we will get this mm -hmm. $80 million licensing fees in the bank in time to be spent during this budget period is a gamble at best. And what the papers say, too, is some of the other taxes that she's proposing to bring back, that's not well, the, something that's passed yet. The cigarette tax is a classic. Well, cigarette right, tax, right. the registration tax, the gasoline tax. I mean, if we, did, if we did a... Well, the uh, gas tax is particularly it. concerning. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and it's the national experts are predicting a, you know, a $4 a gallon summer. Um, so for us to be adding to that even further is really concerning. And, and I hate these punitive taxes. Uh, should we be taxing cigarettes uh, to, to a significant degree? Yeah, I think we should, absolutely. But do you want to tax, you know, tax it to the point where people you know, are going to go broke to, to mm -hmm. buy? It, it, but but it, 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 for, it, for cigarettes, example, it goes beyond that. We have a tremendous amount of state revenue coming from folks in Massachusetts who come up here to buy their liquor and buy their, buy their cigarettes. cigarettes. Yeah. And and so we're you know if we put it if we push it to the point where it's not worth the tank you know the the gallon of gas to come up here and buy your your cigarettes anymore then we've sort of shot ourselves it, in the foot. It, it goes even deeper though with with the, their platform. Why again? And this didn't start yesterday. This is a messaging issue we've had for right. a long time. With I, I heard this thing. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. Is you know I travel and sales. I was in Connecticut and I'm listening to talk radio, of course. And they did it. Uh, uh, they were doing the thing on cigarette tax. So they took Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the lowest per capita income in the entire state, and they took right down the road uh, Westport, Connecticut, which is the highest per capita income in the entire state. Bridgeport, one in every four people smoke. At Westport, one in every two hundred smoke. So when you put these taxes on here, these right. these are penalty taxes to the ones they supposedly want to protect. The the They're most vulnerable, smoke. the poorest citizens in our. In our in our state, mm -hmm. there's no question about it that that and those statistics I think play out nationally. If you there's there have been studies done, yeah, it wouldn't change. So, but but the other thing, and you know this is you know half joking, but not really. You know is we we decide that we are going to tax things that are bad behaviors, unhealthy behaviors, and we say we'll tax them and we'll try to get people to quit smoking, so that and it's for their own good. Mm -hmm. We want them to be healthy. Well, now we're if you tax them to the point now where everybody stops smoking. A whole lot of revenue dries up quick for the state, doesn't it? You know, and and it's and it, and, a, and that's not a policy statement of any kind. It's just, it, it's just such convoluted thinking. That's right. Taxation of any kind on any item, however, whenever we have that conversation, has a negative effect. It, it it has it right. It has it has consequences, and it's got to be um, it's got to be done thoughtfully. It's got to be done with an eye for funding the necessary functions of government and no more. Yeah, I'd like to see the the, the, um, the breakdown of the vote of the people who, because the beer tax went down in flames. The beer tax went down in flames because of the union. But but listen, that's the, why. The, the, no, the beer, the, yeah, the, but the beer tax went down in flames because Governor Hassan came out very clearly and said, "I will veto the beer right. tax." So I have to ask her, why have I not heard her say, "I will veto the gas tax." I will veto. You know, get, let's let's look at these lists of taxes mm -hmm. that are being offered. Follow the money. If she was willing to come out and make it clear on the beer tax, so why not come out others. and make it clear on all the others? I will, I will not veto this tax. I will veto that tax. And the other question that has to be asked is, if casino gaming fails, if the expansion of gambling fails, what taxes will she increase? Because she's going to have an $80 million hold to fill. How is she going to do that? Well, she probably thinks with cigarette tax. <laughs> Not eighty million dollars no. worth. I can't. No, nobody can smoke that much. No. You know, I was going to say I can't smoke that much. I don't smoke. You know, one, but, um, one thing that bothers me too uh, up there is I don't see them going after the. I think overstaffing in some of the departments that they have. I don't see them evaluating the worthiness of some of the programs right. that they have. 
I don't see them evaluating. You can't, everything doesn't work out. Right. You should be, you know, It's okay to out. say so, this, this, didn't, this didn't quite pan out the way we expected That's right. It to. So right. we're dropping right. that program right. or we're revising it, but I don't see any of that approach right. to really trying to save some of our well, money. I remember when Kevin Smith was running in the primary, he talked about his time working for the governor uh, under Craig Benson mm -hmm. uh, in the Department of Juvenile Justice. And at, I think he was deputy director or something like that. And in, his, in that role, he came up with what was essentially a taxpayer's report card, where they evaluated what works and mm -hmm. what doesn't, mm -hmm. and went back and said, okay, let's, let's eliminate this, let's add that, let's fix this, and actually took it. And that's the kind of, I'm not familiar enough with uh, the size of, you know, each of these, each of the departments and agencies to say this one's overstaffed or understaffed. But mm -hmm. I do know um, that we, the people, pay for government and that our leaders have an obligation to make sure that government is streamlined, that it's effective, and that it's as cost efficient as possible right. so that our tax burden is as minimal as possible. Well, the, the biggest agency is HHS. They have 40% of the budget, and it's probably a little bit more than that. And they have a lot of uh, non-for-profit non organizations working for under contract. I don't see the evaluation of those, I, but that's usually where you go. You go to the right. biggest one that's using most of the money, and you find out where you can have some more efficiencies, right. more effectiveness, and I just don't see that. Uh, we well, have an audit department up there, and the, the audit reports are not paid attention to. There was a study done, again, I believe it was under Governor Benson, mm -hmm. on some of these issues, and, and it was a broad-based government study that... Um, made gave a whole list of suggestions on what to do to save money and and the money to, to streamline government make it more cost effective um, and I believe that that study you know is somewhere sitting on a shelf gathering dust I don't think that anything was ever implemented ever done from it, it. No. Yeah. I mean they, they say look you're gonna harm this but you know the mental health which is a big uh, right. problem right now isn't getting uh, the proper treatment well, let's find out what an effective treatment is, and right. let's, let's use that. Well, and why are we not getting the right treatment right. to the right patients? Where's, yeah. where's the breakdown? Sometimes you need to fund a program more, or sometimes a program needs more money, and they need more staff. Sometimes you can give them all the money in the world, but there's a breakdown in the process that isn't being touched. And if you don't fix that breakdown, That's right. the problem's going to continue. So, of course, we have, it's just like in business. You have to bring you know, a, a judicious eye to, to the process and figure out what's working and what's Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, they don't run anything like a business. So, well, and, and it never will, I guess. State gov you know, government, state, federal, never will. But, some but of the, we can bring a lot of business uh, acumen to the process. Some of the states that have a, a business-oriented governor, Utah's one of them, mm -hmm. has, has done sure. a very good job in paring down well, the cost. Look at the, one of the first things they're trying to repeal is the, the whole education bill that we did last yeah. year. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, and that's something that folks in Nashua should really be up in arms about. And if this is another one of those things that is easily understood as a nonpartisan issue. I forget the exact name. The um, ta uh, Education Tax Credit Scholarship Fund, I think, something, something like that. Like that. Um, this is a great program. It allows private entities, not tax dollars, private entities to be donated to a fund that is translated into scholarships uh, for students who are either, whether they're in failing schools or in a school that doesn't meet their needs. What, so parents can apply for these funds and move their students into a better educational environment for that student. And these are, and, we're, and it targets families who can't afford to go out and pay tuition at a private mm -hmm. institution somewhere. That just passed last year. This is a great opportunity law and over 250 families have, are, students have already applied for these scholarships. Over $150,000 have, has already been raised to start creating these scholarships. We haven't even had the chance to implement it, to try it. And now they want to repeal, it's like this big repeal of Palooza up and in Congress. I Concord. wonder why that they is. They want to repeal it. And you've got to, you have to question. It is, it is such a, it, it, it's a bill that helps the most vulnerable students. No matter what your economic situation is, no matter what zip code you live in, this is an opportunity for parents who are concerned about their children getting the, the appropriate education to be able to, to, to access the opportunity that people like Governor Hassan's children have those opportunities. Our children have those opportunities, but not all of our neighbors do. So for them to want to crush this without even giving it the chance to work 
when the people have shown such a strong interest in it and the private entities are already proven they're ha that they're willing to fund it, it makes no sense. And to me, it just reeks of this kind of elitist, you know, what's good for us isn't necessarily Once good again, for you. Once again, if anyone doesn't think this is 100% motivated by the teachers union, they're out of their minds. That's all this is. And, and that's the message we have to but get. But I don't, I don't get that. I don't get that argument for it. I mean, I understand what you're saying and, what, and why you're saying it, but I, it's, it's, it's self-defeating. I mean, we want every student to have the best possible education. And if there are some students who will be better served in a different educational environment than the public schools, then that frees up the teachers no, in our public schools that. to give a more attention and greater quality to the students who are there. No one can convince me the teachers' union even cares about the kids. It's nothing well, to do with the kids at all. It's I'll, about their pensions, their salaries, their jobs, and that's it. That's where if, it stops. If you're talking about union administrators, union leadership, that's one thing. I, I would say very strongly that um, I think some of the best people in our community oh, are our teachers. teachers. I agree. You know, but, but, but yet you have, to, you have to say that. You have to articulate that. They are dealing with extraordinary challenges, uh, children with great uh, you know, difficulties uh, in the same classroom with children of extraordinarily high ability. There's all sorts of challenges that they deal with every single day. I, I don't want to see our teachers penalized. However, there is no question that the agenda of the union is very different than that. And, uh, and I think that you're right, that there's a lot of, that's a lot of what's behind this. You couldn't pay me enough to be a teacher because of what they're going through. Right. Their hands are tied. They can't take brats like I was when I was a kid and discipline me anymore. They can't do anything. But the other fat cats sit up there and take it all. They should. And, and well. some of the good teachers go to the charter schools now because even though they're making less money, they have an environment that right. they're as happy as the kids are. They can are. teach. Exactly. And they can, can teach and you get teach. much a lot of reward for there, that. You know, there, somebody had said to me um, earlier today uh, something about education that, you know, they said we need to extend the school day by a couple of hours, increase the pay accordingly, um, and take unions out of the equation. I was like, and, and I just thought, yeah, that could work. <laughs> what an idea. And reward spend the more, good ones. Spend more time, and, and, that's, well, that, and that's, what we, that's, what, that's what the idea was, you know, increase the pay. Good teachers should have the opportunity, right. you know, extraordinary teachers should have the opportunity to be compensated accordingly. Um, it, it, bad teachers, and there are always a couple, just like in any job anywhere, there are always a couple of people who aren't so good at it. The school system should have the opportunity to give those folks the, the chance to seek, you uh, know, a, a, an alternate career. <laughs> I, I was told so. that uh, in, in my uh, business experience in management, you're doing the person a favor. If they're not doing a good job, they may find a, a, a happier situation someplace right. else and some other kind of work. Right. It, we are not serving our teachers well in the current system. Right. There's no question about it. And it, you, so. Na Nashua can't have just one person being uh, approached as a re in remedial teaching. Oh my uh, gosh, right, when, when, right. Uh, and, and have 1,800 of our high school graduates taking remedial classes in our community college. Oh God. Okay, that's, so that's, that's something that somebody good. should be talking about. Well, and, and, and that is something we're hearing from the community college level, that they're getting high school graduates at the college right. level now who cannot function with some of the basic academic skills that we're supposed to be learning. Uh, in elementary and high school. That is a, a, a and, and at the same time, parallel to that, we're having the conversation about not having skilled workers, that we're not providing, what, you know, that one of the problems that we have with, with companies not coming here to build their businesses is that we cannot provide them with skilled workers. Well, it's not about throwing uh, unlimited funds at the university system. You know, this is a problem that starts much earlier than that mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. requires uh, a very different kind of attention. Right. Well, Jennifer, it's nice talking to you. We're running Is it that out of time, time already. already. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I really appreciate I love you Thanks coming, coming here. In. We're going to have yeah. you here again. Work. So thank you very much. Uh, so you can and, get uh, us up to date on what's happening at the legislature level. And, and let's make a very warm invitation to everybody watching to come out and start attending the Nashua Republican City Committee That's right. meetings. Get to know us better. To bring to come and tell us what the important issues are. We want to hear from Bring this. some friends. We want new folks to get involved. We want the opportunity to have that conversation with them. At the end of the program, you'll see our website, which is at nashuagop.org. We meet uh, second Thursday of every month at the Crown Plaza. 
So you're welcome to come. We have interesting speakers. Uh, tonight, Jennifer Horn's going to be speaking at our meeting. <laughs> Straight from here, right? Uh, right from here. And so uh, we'd like to see you down here, and we'd like to see you bring your friends and neighbors down. And give us a call, too. Phone numbers are attached at the end of the, uh, of the show, and you'll be able to call us and with your questions or with your suggestions on who we should be talking to next time. Okay? Thank, thank you, you so all much. again, and thank you for thank listening. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Jen.